161. Good to see everybody that's returned back tonight. Many folks are not back with us tonight. Kind of to be expected. It was kind of a long day. Some of you have been going since early this morning. I realize that. I can sympathize and empathize with you. But it's been a good day as far as participation in and trying to console and show our affection for the Grider family and the, all those that work today to make that together, put that together, so thankful for you, and uh, once again, I was uh, just really impressed with everything that took place, and so thankful to have such good folks working for us, uh, but doesn't mean we're not tired, and I've already got people pointing at their watches, and uh, I felt really special a while ago, I had probably about six people in the kitchen bowing at my feet, begging me to make this short tonight, so... We've been studying the book of Revelations. We were in Revelations 10 tonight, but I decided that, uh, you know, probably be better to look at something a little less, uh, well, a little more simplistic. And uh, not, not that of not great value, but something that uh, be a little shorter and at the same time be something that I think will be, you can leave here uh, with something to take with you. We always want to do that when we come together. The simplicity that we have in Christ. I remember, I, I just have an uncanny way of getting in trouble. And uh, I just got hung up on this Mason thing when I was in school. And uh, I was recruited by the Masonic Lodge. A couple of the guys that uh, were Masons there had come in the grocery store and were trying to uh, get me to uh, join the Masonic Lodge. And I just told him, I said, uh, well, what do you got to do? And he said, well, we can't tell you. What you've got to do, you've got you to come to the meetings. And I said, well, why can't you tell me? And uh, they said, well, it's just, you know, certain things we just can't publicize. And I said, so what you're trying to tell me is you have a, it's a secret organization. They were like, oh, no, no, there's no secrets. It's not a secret organization. I said, well, why can't you tell me? And they said, well, we just can't. And I said, well, that's a secret. And they said, no, it's not a secret. And I'm like, well, I know a secret when I hear one. And uh, that's what that is, but uh, so I, I didn't make the Masonic line up there, if you will. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I went to a denomination that just really came down hard. I didn't even know what a Masonic lodge was. But what I wanted to draw from that was this, you know, you got to have this certain kind of hand grip, the lion's paw grip, the baptism of higher and abyss. You can go around the world on a penny, you know, if you have the right penny. Uh, all those kind of traditions that go along with that, and it's a real... Um, uh, exclusive group, you know, you, you've got to be invited in. You just can't, you know, walk in. And that is the absolute uh, antithesis of the Lord's church. The Lord's church, we do everything that we can to try to get people to come in. We want to teach people the gospel. We're an open book. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, the Bible says, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We, we don't have anything to hide. Brethren, we have to be careful that we don't ever think that we know more than God and that maybe if we would just alter the message a little bit, especially in going in, that we could be more appealing to the world and, and then somehow, you know, once we get them thinking that, well, hey, this ain't such a bad thing, then drop the bomb on them as far as, you know, obeying the gospel. Uh, we, don't, we don't work like that. We're not dishonest. We don't walk around in craftiness. But handling the word of God deceitfully, we don't do that. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, here's what we're about. We are an open book. If you want to know what we believe, all you have to do is turn to the pages of the New Testament. That is our creed. That is what we stand on. And that is where we are. Paul says if it's hid, if our gospel be hid, it's hidden them that are lost. Uh, people just don't want to see so you see, in the, in the book of Corinthians, even over in chapter 6, in chapter 6, beginning with verse 11, it says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. That's how we operate with people. Listen, we want you to be a part of us. In fact, that's our job as Christians. We want to solicit. We want to 
make other little Christians. Um, our, our mouths are open to folks. We want people to be a part of the church. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized, that's all there is to it. He that believes, somebody obeys the gospel, then guess what? They are a part of the fellowship. They are a part of this body with all the privileges that are due any member. Uh, that's, that's inclusive. I mean, that's, that's everything. Everything. You think about the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. I remember when I was going through my struggles trying to figure out what was right and what wasn't right. One of the things that kept jumping out at me, and I know we only quote part of the verse, but it's the part that really bears out. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, what must a man do to be saved? Well, what does the Bible say? And I know I've told you this so many times, you probably hurt your ears, but I'll tell you again. Sinner's prayer is not in there. I didn't know that at one time, but it's not there. What you do find is people hearing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, believing it. And in believing it, they were willing to change their mind, to repent. They were willing to stand before men and say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And they were baptized. And when they did that, they were part of the membership. They were New Testament Christians. There wasn't any bylaws. There wasn't any voting in. There wasn't any closed communion, open communion, things of this nature. That was it. And brethren, it is the same way today. And yet many folks don't know that. You, you look at the simplicity that we have in the New Testament church. You look at something like the monstrosity that's over there in the Vatican and the college of the cardinals and the bishops and the chain of command from the priests to the nuns and so forth and the biggest organization that calls itself Christians. And then you go to the pages of the Bible and you find that about as you know, high up in that thing as you get it, the, the, the ecclesiastical structure is the local church. It doesn't get any bigger than that. You have elders in, in the local church. You have deacons in the local church. You have evangelists in the local church. You have membership in the local church. And that local church doesn't have any responsibility or any uh, say over other congregations. It doesn't mean they can't build each other up. It doesn't mean they can't work together. But it means this congregation can't tell that congregation what it's going to do. That's about as simplistic as you can get. No synods. No general conferences where we get together and see what part of the Bible we want to believe this time, what part of the Bible we want to obey. That's how simple it is, preaching and teaching the gospel. Do you realize that to do what I'm doing right now, to stand before a membership and preach, in some denominations you have to be board certified. That's right. You've got to have a college degree from an institution. Ooh, excuse me from an institution that that group says is a valid institution, and then you have to be certified by that particular denomination to even stand in the pulpit. You don't find that in the Lord's church. You have a fellow obey the gospel and he's fired up about it? Let me ask you something. You think the Ethiopian eunuch went home and preached the gospel? I believe so. I believe he went home and preached the gospel. Uh, in fact, all the folks you find, when the church dispersed out, what happened? They went everywhere. The disciples, not just preachers. The disciples went everywhere. And what were they doing? Preaching the gospel. Today, the Apostle Paul couldn't preach in some pulpits in our country. Because he didn't have the right credentials. That's absolutely amazing. The idea of preaching and teaching the God's word. Praying. So simple. We could stop right now. And any man in here could lead us in a prayer. You, right now, by yourself, could just stop. And in your own mind... Go to God in prayer. It's that simple. Petition God yourself. We are all priests. And yet there are groups that believe you have to have somebody that's a, a priest in order to do that. To petition God for you. All can pray. The Bible teaches that each one of us can do that. You remember not too long ago when I preached a lesson about the churches, you know, on the fringe. We called them the, the reformers and their stepchildren. How that in the thousand years ago, people were being put to death because they handled the, uh, the bread and the vine and handed that out to other people. And they weren't priests. And they prayed in 
their vernacular tongue. In other words, we call that English. A lot of them were speaking German and things of that nature. You see, they were put to death because they weren't praying in Latin. They thought that they were making a mockery of the Lord's Supper because the fellow that was handing out the emblems wasn't a ordained priest. It's amazing, isn't it? You see the simplicity in Christ? Any man a member of the Lord's Church can hand out these instruments. There's a, I've even seen women do this in congregations where you just have women. Who's going to pass out the emblems? Well, it's going to be ladies. Now, of course, you wouldn't want to do that where there's men. But, you know, that it, there's no qualification. You don't have to turn your collar around backwards to administer or to hand out the Lord's Supper. The simplicity that's in the Lord's Church. Think about singing. I remember years ago when I changed schools one time, I'd never been to a school that had a singing program, and I went to Rossville, South Rossville Elementary. And the lady was right in the middle of a program. I don't know what time of year it was, but she was trying to get these kids ready for this program. And she came over and she said, you need to come here and stand for a minute. She says, okay, I'm going to play and I want you to sing happy birthday. Well, I'd never done anything like that. So she started playing, so I started singing. She says, you can't carry a tune in a bucket. She says, go sit down. And so, hey, I can't sing. The teacher said I couldn't. So I just believed I couldn't sing, even though I did it with the radio all the time. But then, you know, a few years later, I started going to a church of Christ, and I sang with them, and they asked me if I wanted to lead singing one time. And I was going like, y'all don't understand, I can't sing. I was told the fifth grade, I can't carry a tune in the bucket, I can't sing. And they said, won't you give it a try? So I got up there and sang the song that they'd been singing, and sure enough, then they told me what a good job I'd done. See how sim simple that is? You don't have to be the best song leader in the world. Just get it started. The singing that we do, it doesn't have to be four-part harmony. It's nice if it is. But think about how simplistic. You don't have to have somebody. I mean, do you know how churches scramble when the person who plays the piano is sick that week? Or the guitar player for the band is sick? they got to have somebody fill in. Do you know how hard they scramble to do that, these groups that use that? The Lord's Church, we simply sing. We simply sing. And then you think of the Lord's Supper. Some groups, you have to say it in Latin, and you can only give out one part of the emblem. Sometimes the priests drink all the wine, and then there's groups that practice open and closed communion. Now, that's not very much done nowadays. Of course, many people don't even take the Lord's Supper nowadays. That's one of the reasons we don't have that problem. L.L. Bregence uh, was a great gospel preacher. He was visiting with the congregation one time. And the people there didn't recognize him, and they said, listen, this is not our supper. If it was our supper, then we'd be happy to set to share this with you. But this is the Lord's supper. And uh, Brother Bridget says, well, if it was your supper, I might not take it. But since how it's the Lord's supper, I think I'll help myself. You see, they were trying to not let him do that by practicing closed communion. And you just don't see that in the Bible. You just don't see that in the Bible. Uh, giving. Once again, very simple. No set limit. I remember when I was in denominational era, we got little envelopes, even have your name printed on it, and you'd put your tithe in there, and they kept up with that. And if you missed a couple, guess what? There'd be somebody who writes you a letter and won't know where your tithe was. Now, you don't find that in the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament, they had tithing, but we're under the New Covenant. The, the Bible tells us to give as we have been prospered. And there's no set limit. There's no... Uh, rules about that where you know you give a, a certain amount or else you're free to give as one chooses then we think about the plan of salvation you can't get much simpler than the plan of salvation first of all people have to be taught they have to hear they have to come to the understanding that Jesus is the Christ that there's a God in heaven that God sent his son that Christ was in heaven emptied himself was willing to come down to live the life of a man, die that death on the cross, as prophesied, that they knew that was what was going to take place. You've got to come to understand that. It's a taught religion. And so how are you taught? You listen. You hear. Maybe you read. But one way or another, you've got to be taught to believe. That's part of the plan of salvation, to believe. Remember what the eunuch asked Philip, says, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And, of course, the gospel preacher Philip says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he made that great confession. You see, he had to believe. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? You can't be faithful to something, be committed to something you don't believe. 
And then the idea of repent. Once again, very simple. You're going in one direction. You're following after the word. The world. The Bible tells you, it tells us we need to repent. We need to change our minds. Don't go the direction the world would tell us we need to go in, but go the direction that God would have us to go in. And He's given us book after book with details about how to do that very thing, how to change our lives, to do what's right, and not do what's wrong. And the idea of confession. I was taught early in life that you had to confess your sins. That's what that confession was. But that's not what we find in Scripture. What we find in Scripture, the confession is that Jesus is the Christ. Remember when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, that confession... I will build my church. Paul picks up on the same thing, Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Jesus would say the same in Matthew 10, 31, 2. Confess me before men. I'll confess you before. It's so simple to confess that Jesus is the Christ. And still simple, not hard to understand, the teaching that one must be baptized for the remission of their sins. Let's just say we're reading our Bibles and we come across Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Let's see, back it up a verse. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What do you think that's saying? Well, it sounds to me like he's saying that you have to believe and you have to be baptized. I think that's right. Acts 2.38, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 37, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Ananias would tell Paul, Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. 1 Peter 3.21, the Bible says, The light figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. With just those verses... And you were to be asked, do you think that that's teaching baptism is essential to salvation? What would your conclusion be? Well, how could you read that? How could you listen to that and come away with any other conclusion? You'd have to have some help. You'd have to have some help. And that's what we were talking about today in Colossians chapter 2. There's a lot of folks that would make, uh, you know, booty of you. They would make, they would rob you of your reward. They would beguile you by trying to teach you some type of philosophy or something that would take you away from the simplicity that is, that is in Christ Jesus. There's nothing overly dramatic, overly, uh, what would you say, physical? I don't know what you'd say. Uh, there's no red carpet. There's no you know, paparazzi chasing uh, Christians around to, to see how we get up every morning and live our lives. You, you see that simplicity of getting up every morning and saying, listen, today I am going to be christ like I'm going to do the best I can to do what I can to, to help people, to help them see the Christ in me. That's an everyday thing. That's an everyday activity. It's simple. There's not a lot to it, but i tell you what, it's tough. And not a lot of people want to walk that walk. They don't want to do that, so they're always looking for some kind of something spectacular, some kind of healing or some kind of miraculous thing they've seen somewhere, somewhere to keep that hair on fire, 24 hours a day as they run through their life doing, uh, doing their thing. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we can be a Christian. We need to live our lives the best we can. Be faithful. To get up every day. Go to work. Provide for our families. Be the kind of father. Be the kind of mother. Be the kind of influence that we ought to be. You look at the life of Jewel Ryder as Barry so ably did today. What a wonderful example. What a wonderful example of the simplicity that's in Christ Jesus and the great faithfulness and the great example that she's left, that her husband's left. Um, I just think uh, the simplicity that is in Christ is, is just ungetoverable. Perhaps you're here tonight, you're not a New Testament Christian. It's not a difficult thing. It's very simple. You have to have help to misunderstand it. Maybe you've listened to some of the things we've talked about tonight. You're going like, man, I, I've never heard that before. I would like to know more about that. Well, we would love to study with you and to show you what the Bible has to say, even though I think tonight we've pretty much went over 
some of the you know greater points of what it takes to be a Christian. It's not a hard thing to do. It's just accepting the fact of it. In fact, I fought against it. A lot of people do that. Perhaps you're here tonight and you'd like to obey the gospel. Man, we'd love to help you with that. Maybe as a Christian you've left your first love, or maybe as a Christian you're just struggling. There's things in your life that's just, it's just tough. And you haven't done anything wrong, but you could use the prayers of your brothers and sisters. You know, sometimes, brethren, I think that's an avenue that we don't take advantage of. When I first came into the church, there was people responding all the time, not to be baptized, not to confess sin, but just saying, listen, man, I am going through it right now. I need your help. I need your prayers. I need your love. I need you to tell me you love me. I need to know that you care about me. I don't see that much anymore. I don't think we've changed as people. I think we've just walled up a little bit. Maybe that's just not as popular as it once was. But I'll tell you what, we're here to help you in any way that we can. We love you. Nobody in this world loves you as much as the folks in this room. We want to see you get to heaven. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing. <laughs>